Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 29 of the Leo Training Podcast. This week's guest is Sarah Black. Sarah is the lead athletic therapist for Men's Row in Canada. In this episode, Sarah and I discuss some of the common injuries that face the rowing team, as well as injury prevention strategies and rehabilitation strategies. One of the key injury prevention strategies that we discuss during this interview is FRC, or Functional Range Conditioning. Functional range conditioning is a comprehensive joint training system that is based in scientific principles and research that has been developed by Dr. Andreo Spina. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode, and hopefully you can take away some actionable steps that can help you during your training and practice. Sarah Black, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm really looking forward to having you on. Thanks for having me, Joe. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, an honor, and uh, we have some great material uh, in store for the audience. Um, but before we get rolling on to the topics, why don't you take a couple minutes, uh, introduce yourself for those that aren't familiar with you and who you are and what you do, and let them know a little bit more about your uh, line of work and your background. Sounds good. Um, so I'm a certified athletic therapist, um, as well as a uh, um, Certified strength and conditioning specialist and certified exercise physiologist. Um, I'm currently working with the Canadian National Heavyweight Men's Program out in Victoria, BC. Um, I've been in this role for about two and a half years. Um, prior to that, I was working with the kind of adapted para sport uh, population as a strength and conditioning coach um, before graduating from my athletic therapy degree. Um, so that's kind of what I do. That's that's awesome. Um, so how did you how did you get into that as a career? Was it just something you you know you love learning about health and fitness, um, the human body? What what kind of took you down that path? Yeah, so I always kind of had um, the end goal of working in sport in mind. Um, ideally, I wanted to become an Olympic athlete, but uh, that wasn't in the cards with my physiology and build. So um, I decided to kind of help in the way of a, a support staff. Um, so I was out in Ontario uh, doing my fitness and health diploma and um, playing varsity volleyball at the time and had a, quite a few injuries of my own. Um, so spent a lot of time with the athletic therapist and that's kind of what sparked my interest in terms of the more rehabilitation um, field. But I still had this interest in strength and conditioning and, um, and performance. So that's kind of what led me to athletic therapy because it kind of has that, um, that mix of kind of performance and rehab. And, um, it's, it's really cool to be able to have both of those niches and be able to kind of bridge that gap between, you know, injury, injury prevention, rehab, and then, uh, performance. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's three areas that I'm really uh, always excited to learn about myself, and um, it's amazing. You know, they <laughs> they very much blend together in, in the athletic world. Um, there's not a, a, a hard and fast line between between the three because when you're riding that that fine uh, line of high performance, you're usually you know pushing your your physical and mental limits, and with that can come the uh, the injuries. Yeah, exactly. Um, what I find with working in more high performance is that you don't actually have time to peel back um, to kind of some of the basic movements or injury prevention protocols that you might do with the average population because you can't take them out of training. So how how do you blend? How do you how do you make them move better and perform better without interfering with the training they have to do in order to 
succeed in their sport. So it is a very integrated um, kind of dance. And I work very closely with our strength and conditioning coaches and coaches and physiologists to make sure that, you know, we're intervening everywhere we can without having an impact on their fitness or their progression in their sport. That's awesome. A um, couple key points I think you made there is one is the, the communication and collaboration with, with the other coaches um, within the team, you know, both on the rowing strength and, and conditioning side uh, and the exercise physiology side. And then also um, just the, the time constraints on the, on the athlete. Um, so could you talk a little bit one about, um, how you are able to execute that integrated approach with, with the other coaches? And then two is how do you get the most out of the time, um, and follow through on, you know, trying to, trying to have a catch all in terms of covering the preventative rehabilitative and performance side when it comes to the training. Yeah. So one, one benefit that we have as a high performance sport is, well, one, the rowing team is centralized. So they're in Victoria year round. We have the same staff, um, all of which is, you know, full time with rowing. So we're completely dedicated to these athletes um, and have the ability to um, intervene or support on a, on a daily basis where, you know, some less performance athletes or other sports that aren't centralized. Um, it's a little more intermittent and a little more, um, kind of online. Um, so we definitely have an advantage of, you know, being together as a group all the time. Um, and so, um, we try to, to utilize that, um, advantage and, you know, get them involved or get a, get the staff involved in everything that they do. So as the lead therapist, you know, I, I run their warmups, um, on a regular basis. Sometimes they do their own as well. So we know that they know how to do it. Um, so I'm able to kind of intervene there and integrate um, certain exercises I want them to do during the warm up and correct form as they're going through those movements. Um, you know, I have the opportunity to go on the water with them or review video um, and see what we could do to either if they have an injury going on, you know, what could be causing this injury. Or do I see a risk factor that we need to address before there's an injury? Or are they just looking for that extra kind of um, advantage to perform better, to move better? And um, and then that that carries on to the gym and the erg room as well. And like I'm I basically have the opportunity to see them in every aspect of of their training and can intervene wherever I see fit. So I try not to bug them when they're row rowing or right. Like right. That, that's the coach's role. Um, but I'm often, you know, watching them taking videos, slowing the video down, chatting with the coaches or the SNC coach while they're training and then working together to try and figure out how we're going to intervene with them once they're either off or, or the coach would then go in and say, Hey, we're noticing this. Can you try this technique? Or so it's very collaborative and very integrated in all aspects of training. So that's, that's a huge advantage, um, to be able to kind of get to things right away, right when we see it happening. And that way we can kind of mitigate the injuries, but also improve performance. Um, in terms of the time constraints, obviously they have a lot of training. Rowing is an endurance sport, so there's a lot of hours that they need to be training in order to get fitter and stronger and faster. Um, so my interventions, I try to integrate into things that they're already doing. So like I mentioned before, some of the correctives we do are built into their warm-ups. We've started to individualize some of their warm-ups too. So they're doing some specific things specific to them in their warm-up. Um, I'm also involved in their strength and conditioning program. 
Um, so they kind of have a few exercises that I choose for them as part of either their warm up or kind of um, um, accessory stuff at the end. So we really try and fit it in so they're not doing like an hour, two hours of kind of preventative um, exercises on their own on top of this six or seven hours they're already of doing of training. Um, you know, that's, that's been tried in the past um, and it just doesn't get done. So <laughs> we've um, recovery is key. So their recovery time, we want to try and keep it to their recovery time and build things in as we can. Um, that being said, there are definitely guys that have to do a little of the extra work. Um, so we just try and build it as best as they can, um, to set them up for success. That's, that's awesome. Um, so because of the centralized approach, if you, if you didn't have that, the ability to one collaborate with all the coaches in one location and the athletes all being there, would you even be able to pull that off? Um, I don't think so. (laughs) Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of kind of discussion going on in the background and not being able to see the athlete day to day. It just, well, it's hard to individualize a program for someone when you don't see how they move and don't see how your um, intervention has, has made a change or hasn't made a change. So how, how do you know when to tweak things um, if you can't see or feel like as therapists, we often feel, um, how do you make sure that you're maximizing those interventions? If you can't see day to day, how they're making an impact on, on the athlete. Right. Right. Um, Absolutely. I, one of the things I I also love that that you said is even though you're, you're, you're going to have sort of dedicated time blocked out to work with, with them, I also love the fact that you are spending time and attending, whether it's, you know, on the water or on the erg or in the strength and conditioning room, you're observing the athletes all the time. And, uh, that is one, like you said, that you, you wouldn't be able to do that unless you're in a centralized location. And then two, it affords you the ability to really, really dial in the program and make it very customized to each athlete. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, yeah, so at the at the beginning of the year, we often go through like a musculoskeletal screen, a physical competency screen, and so that kind of builds our our platforms for how we're going to individualize their SNC program or their warm ups or their preventative exercises, um, and gives me guidance for what I need to work on with them in terms of manual therapy to get the best out of them. But then it's constantly evolving based on what we're seeing on the boat, um, on the erg, in the weight room, injuries that might be occurring. Um, so we kind of start with a, a base line and then, you know, set, set goals from there. But then we're constantly evolving based on what we're seeing day to day. Right. That's, that's really, really cool. Um, I think that's fantastic. Uh, so, um, I guess my, my other question with that is, does each athlete, um, like how much individualization or customization is there? Like, is each athlete doing a different, you know, exercises for strength and conditioning and warm up, you know, because of their, you know, their specific needs or maybe, you know, past medical or injury history? Um, there's not a complete different program um, for them. Obviously, in crew settings, you know, a lot of the aerobic training has to be the same, especially when you're you're in a boat um, with other crew members. Um, the S and C, you know, there's a a specific kind of um, skeleton. And then some of the warm ups and accessory movements are more individualized. Awesome. Um, That's so cool. That is awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, so, kind of building on that, what are some of the most common injuries that that you see? One, I guess, across 
across the sport of rowing. And then two, um, you know, are there anyone, any specific injuries that, um, seem to occur more, you know, on a more frequent basis on, on the men's team? Um, well, I haven't worked too much with women. Um, before I started here, I was working at a university, but that was also with the men's team. So I won't speak too much about, um, women cause that's not my area of experience right now. Um, but but for our specific, you know, in rowing, you hear the common, you know, low back, ribs, and kind of wrists, forearms are kind of the top three typical if you look maybe across across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, we typically don't get too many forearm issues. Um, I think it's kind of once you get to the level where you're training as much as these guys have, um, you don't tend to have that kind of overuse, um, either tendinopathy or um, other kind of wrist issues creep up as as frequently as some of the maybe more novice uh, groups. Because um, I definitely saw a lot more of that when I was working at a university. Right, uh, right. Very cool. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Um, we've actually had a huge decrease in rib injuries in the last three years. And, um, I think a big part of that is the change in technique. Um, we had a head coach change after 2012 and, and it's, it's quite different in, in the technique and the way that, uh, the body is loaded. So prior to 2012, it was kind of more of a, a heavy lean back and um, I wasn't with the team at the time, but um, from what I've heard, there were quite a few rib stress fractures. Um, and now we've kind of shifted. It's more front end heavy and a pretty short lean back um, sitting up really tall at the finish. So we've definitely had a decrease in rib stress fractures over the last few years, um, which is great. Um but with a change of stroke comes other other issues. So we're typically seeing a little more knee injuries than you might expect with um, with rowing, um, and I think that's more due to the the heavy load at the front end um, in terms of change of stroke. So um, so I think kind of rib knees that stuff is really going to depend on the technique of of the coach that's working with the group of athletes or the athlete itself. Um, But I think most frequently that you'll see, you know, novice to high performance to masters, men, women, um, regardless of technique is, you know, going to be low back. So um, the just constant flexion and extension through that, through the spine is going to cause, you know, more stress, um, especially through the lumbar spine than um, you'd see with maybe some other sports. Um, right. Especially if they're not, if they're not hinging through the hips and they're constantly moving through the lumbar spine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we see, you know, some consistent bouts of mechanical back pain. Um, you know, there's also, you know, your pathologies as well, your spondies and your kind of discogenic pain or disc herniations. So, you know, there are some cases of that. And typically once that's already happened, there's an alteration of mechanics. So those athletes that have that pathology are always going to be a little more susceptible to low back pain, um, whether it's now mechanical or a a repeat of the pathology or a, uh, a progression of it. So, um, that's, that's typically what kind of we treat the most. Um, and we definitely have strategies in place to try and mitigate that as well. So, um, whether it's, you know, core based exercises, um, we do a lot of, kind of diaphragmatic breathing and um, differentiating the difference between um, superficial core activation versus, you know, deep stabilization, um, which you'll often see with 
with rowers because it's a full body exercise. Um, they're contracting everything through the stroke. So, okay. Yeah. We do want co-contraction of, you know, the hip flexors and back and hip extensors, but are those deep muscles protecting the spine as well? So multifidus transverse abdominis, are we getting diaphragmatic breathing to stiffen the spine or is the co-contraction of, you know, psoas and erectors creating a bit of a guy wire in the spine. Um, right, right. The, um, steering yeah. and, and, um, and ultimately pain and dysfunction. So um, we've, we've addressed that quite a bit this year too, but again, coming back to, we can't um, intervene too much with their training. So it's supplemental. So it's, we're trying to do this at the same time as their training. So um, it's, like I said, a little bit of a dance of, okay, we're going to work on this, but we're not going to take you out of training. Whereas, you know, with with um, other populations, you might say, okay, I want you to be able to do this before we get you to do this. Sure. No, I, uh, I loved how you touched on um, the uh... – you didn't name it specifically, but you kind of touched on the intrinsic subsystem, the multifidi, transverse abdominis, diaphragm, pelvic floor that, you know, forms that, that internal, you know, cylinder and helps to uh, create that internal, uh, intra-abdominal pressure for the mm-hmm. athlete. And then the, uh, you know, the, the super stiffness as uh, Dr. McGill would say, uh, allowing this, the torso to really um, allow movement at the, at the distal ends around the shoulders and the hips. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting because these athletes are so strong. um, When you do typical kind of screening movement screening, the stuff often gets missed because they're able to do the movement. um, Even if they don't have that super stiffness in, in their, uh, in their deep core. So it, it takes a little more unlayering of, of the systems to kind of pin down the, the dysfunction um, through their deep core because their superficial core is so strong that they can kind of compensate and, and make it look like they're doing things really well. Um, And so the movement looks good, but there is an underlying dysfunction there, which can lead to that kind of that guy wire or, or just, um, you know, those, those muscles around the trunk working over time, they're, you know, trying to generate force and stabilize the spine at the same time. Um, and that's when we see that kind of super hyper hypertonic or, or tight musculature around the trunk. And then that leads to kind of compressive forces through the spine, which leads to pain. And then it kind of creates this snowball effect. So, definitely have to kind of assess their movement, but also, you know, have them work with a therapist and, um, you know, kind of unlayer some of that. Okay. So if, if you're not turning this on, can you still stabilize your spine? Um, and Miguel talks quite a bit about that as well. Like, okay, so can you do this movement using the right, things. And again, with high performance athletes, sometimes they don't know what the right things are. So it's, it's, um, it's breaking that down in a quieter setting that, um, that some of those things kind of pop up. Sure. Could you, could you just give like a, an example of, um, you know, maybe a movement where on the surface it, they can, they can execute it. And then something that might allow you to kind of dive a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole and make sure that you're, you're seeing, you know, the stabilization uh, through the core that you're describing and the, the proper muscles are, are working in the right sequence. Yeah. I think, you know, that your basic kind of dead bug is one that um, I find a lot of kind of compensation or, or dysfunction in. Um, it's a pretty simple exercise and, on the surface, it looks pretty easy, especially for a national athlete. Um, but um, 
if they kind of say, oh, this is too easy, that's kind of when I'm like, okay, let's break this down. Are you doing it properly? Because a dead bug, if it's done right, although not as taxing as maybe some other kind of power-based core exercises, if it's done right, it should be challenging. Um, So what I do is kind of look at, okay, what's contracting? Um, Are they able to control their pelvis? Um, Often you'll kind of see the legs and arms kind of just moving up and down, but is there focus in the exercise? Are they anteriorly rotating their pelvis as they lower their leg? Um, Are they flaring their ribs as they bring their arm overhead? Are they extending through that low back or can they maintain neutral? Um, So I find that's a pretty specific exercise that I often see done incorrectly. Um, And it's kind of also one of those exercises that if it's not done correctly, there's not really a purpose in it. Um, um, Bird dogs also kind of, one of those other ones that is often done incorrectly um, and athletes kind of just going through the motions. And it's another one that it's like, okay, could we do something like if you, if you can't find the purpose in the exercise and bring the focus because it looks like a simple exercise, is there something else we could do instead to achieve similar things, but get the focus back to the athletes? Um, I often find working with athletes, if it's not hard, they don't see the purpose in it. So they try to make it hard. Right, right. (laughs) Or they don't do it or they just do it for the sake of doing it and not for the purpose of the exercise. So I've been using kind of more of a bear plank or a quadruped plank variation um, instead of bird dog because I find it just brings that focus back to the core a little more versus just raising arms and legs. So, you know, you stabilize your trunk first and then you can add a leg and arm movements. Um, but I think the, the plank variation just cues the, the trunk to um, create a stable platform versus when they're on their knees they feel like they're already stable. So then they just kind of go through the motions. So those are two exercises I feel are often done incorrectly. And um, if you break them down, you can definitely find faults. Um, And then it's kind of up to you and the athlete, you know, can they take your cues and do it properly or do you have to find an alternative? So you're getting what you want out of the exercise. Um, and not just going through the motions. That was awesome. That was fantastic. I love, I love that. I think that's excellent, excellent advice. And those are two exercises, um, that, you know, people could probably run a check if they find a a well executed, you know, video demonstration of those, if they're not familiar with them already. Um, those are great ones that they could run a, you know, sort of self-assessment, you know, like you talked about pelvic control, rib, rib cage flare, um, so thank you for sharing. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So another topic, uh, and shifting gears a little bit here, but another topic we had down, I'm really excited to talk about this is, uh, the work that you've been doing with the men's team and, uh, implementing and using, uh, the functional range conditioning, um, I guess system by, by Dr. Andrew, Andre Ospina. Yeah, so I took the FRC course uh, last February, so just over a year ago, and it's by far the the best course I've ever taken. And I think a big part of that is that um, Spina, you know, provides you with information and and um, and ideas to provoke a thought process. So more kind of challenge you into critically critically thinking about what your patient or your athlete might need to achieve their movement goals. Um, So what I found, you know, in my few years of taking courses is you go, you learn a method with a protocol and then you try to implement said protocol into your practice. 
And I always, you know, got really excited during Saturday and Sunday. And then you get to Monday, you're back in your clinic or your work and you're like, okay, so how am I going to um, implement this new method into my existing thought process? And so with FRC, it was more, okay, here's what the research is showing in terms of movement, in terms of joint health, in terms of tissue adaptation. And um, here are some strategies to try and um, implement some of that research into, you know, a practical setting. But it's not, okay, this is what you do and this is when you do it. So it really forced you to think about okay, so what am I trying to achieve here? How can I use this research to apply to my practice, whether manual or exercise, to, to achieve what I'm, what I'm going for? And so it, it's more of a, a thought process and um, kind of, it. I wouldn't say it changed my philosophy, but it really f- helped form my existing philosophy um, in a system that was easy to apply and easy to implement into my existing practice um, because it just kind of took all of my existing thoughts, added some new ones, and made it into this easy-to-use system um, that I could then apply my own ideas into, um, to get, to get more out of, out of my athletes. So, um, it was a really cool course because it, it didn't end on Sunday night. Um, you're constantly thinking and adapting. And, and I think the great thing about the functional anatomy seminars is that, um, the crew there is constantly, um, involving, their practitioners into into discussions into continuing education so that's what I really loved about the course is that the learning hasn't stopped um I can apply you know the ideas and make it specific to rowing um you know I can go online and you know, share a case study or ask for advice from other practitioners that are practicing. Um, so, hi, sorry, is Michelle here? No, no. Okay. Sorry, knock on the door there. Um, it's okay. So it's continually learning. Like, uh, Andreo has, you know, videos on YouTube and on the website and does a lot of podcasts himself. So it's like, it just keeps going, um, which is really rare, I find, to find in a continuing education course. Um, So the thing I see with that is he really wants you to succeed as a therapist and wants, you know, to be able to implement the system into your daily practice, um, and yeah, so I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I took a lot out of it and recently took the functional range release, uh, spine course a few months ago. So now I'm able to implement both the exercise and the manual therapy, um, thing. And it, it blends very nicely together. That's awesome. That's so cool. I, uh, I really liked how you talked about, there's a there's a framework and, uh, you know, the, the principles and strategies, um, you know, based around the, the current research and evidence, but it, it really demands that you learn to think on your feet and find sort of the, the solution for, for that individual. Um, so that's, that's really cool. That's, it's been on my list for a while. I'm, I'm looking, uh, to try to attend an FRC, uh, certification in the, in the fall. So yeah. yeah it just kind of convert, confirmed everything that, uh, that I've been hearing and, and seeing. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about the system for those of who are not familiar with it. It's, it's basically a, a joint training system. So, you know, we're trying to achieve, you know, functional mobility in in each of our joints in order to achieve a movement. 
Um, so it's one thing to practice a movement p- pattern over and over and over again, but if you don't have the prerequisites in your joints to achieve the range of motion they're meant to achieve as a human being or for a particular movement pattern, um, practicing it over and over and over again is, is not going to make that ankle move better. So, um, you know, we often talk about ankles and hips in a squat. So if you're missing dorsiflexion in one ankle, how are you going to achieve that squat? And if you achieve it and, um, but maybe it's not optimal and then you load it, where are you going to break down as a result of that ankle that's not doing its job? Um, and so we see that um, consistently in rowing where it's, you know, it's a monostructural movement, it's in the sagittal plane, um, and we're, you know, doing the same movement over and over and over again. And, okay, we can coach it all we want, but if there's a structural issue that we're not addressing, we're just going to continue to go down kind of that same circle. So it's, it's more about, okay, can we get all the joints moving well and then practice the movement? Um, and so what we've, we've found, and again, it, it comes back to what I was talking about earlier, obviously we can't take them out of training. So it's a bit of a side by side approach. Um, whereas another athlete, you know, if they don't have good dorsiflexion, um, maybe you wouldn't have them squat until you, you, uh, restore that ankle function so that they're not compensating elsewhere. So it's, um, the, the theory is, you know, the joint, the joint capsules, the deepest structure and, you know, everything around it's going to adapt to the position of the joint. So let's target the joint and then see what all the soft tissue does around it. Um, and, uh, so yeah, we've been implementing more of that kind of specific joint training focus, um, with rowing, it tends to be more ankles and hips that we, we see that dysfunction or that, um, restriction in movement. Um, so we're just trying to increase the mobility of those areas. Um, you know, injury occurs when, you know, the load bearing capacity of the tissue is, is less than the load that you put on it. So how do we, A, make a functional joint? Because if we have more mobility, our degrees of freedom increase, which means we have more variables for our movement, which gives us a greater margin of error. So that creates that continuum continuum of mitigating injuries and improving performance. And I, I see those two as a continuum. If you mitigate injuries, you're going to improve your performance. And if you improve your performance um, in terms of the way that you move, you should mitigate that injury risk as well. So um, so we try and get that function of the joint first and then increase that load-bearing capacity of the tissue by gradually increasing the load you put on it so that the tissue can adapt to that load. Um, so that when you do go in a position where you know, maybe it's not optimal, your tissues can withstand that load better. And maybe you don't prevent the injury from happening, happening, but you mitigate the severity of it. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, it's just the, the thought process. uh, Yeah, like I said, it just makes a lot of sense to me. And it seems very well thought out and based around the, the research and evidence. So that's very, very cool. Thank you for taking the time to kind of uh, go a little bit deeper and, and lay out the framework there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know that you um, are up against the time. Uh, so we had about 15 minutes. Um, so is there, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on specific to either FRC or um, rowing, you know, rehab or prevention strategies or anything else that's come to mind? Um, I think one thing um, specific to, to rowing, well, all, all sports, but um, rowing specifically is spinal segmenting. Um, 
it's something that we don't really do well as a human species anymore. Um, and our, our spine is meant to move. Um, so I think, you know, although we often train neutral and want, want um, some of these core exercises done in neutral, it's important that we're able to tolerate loads out of neutral as well. Um, especially in a sport like rowing where you're getting flexion and extension through the spine. We're not going to keep a neutral spine throughout the entire stroke. Um, so we need to be able to tolerate that load through the spine. Um, but before we can tolerate load, we need to make sure we have independent movement through each of the segments. Um, so cat camel, similar to dead bug and bird dog is often done very poorly and incorrectly. And again, it comes down to that. Okay. If you're not doing it right, is there still a purpose of doing it? And the stuff, um, Spina talks a lot about this in FRC is if you're doing a mobility exercise, but you don't have the prerequisites or the inter in independent movement at each segment or at each joint, then are you making the problem worse? Are you continuing to move through the segment that's hypermobile while the hypomobile segments are still moving as one big group because there's no independent movement? So we need to achieve that independent spinal segmentation first before we can um, get interdependence, um, with the joints. Um, so we do kind of some more hinge point training, um, to try and get specific movement through each joint. Um, and that's when, you know, a, a therapist can be useful as well. Is there, you know, a dysfunction at the joint? Are we getting closing angle pain? Is there not glide between the two joints? Um, do we need to restore that with manual therapy before we can get to that hinge point training before we can get to something like a cat camel? Um, so spinal segmenting is something that I think is really important for everyone to do. And there are not many people that can do it well, um, especially if they haven't been training it properly. So you know, we'll continue to work through our dysfunction and our compensations if we don't break things down and work on that independent joint control first. Um, so often, you know, you'll see um, in a cat camel, okay, oh yeah, they're moving through their thoracolumbar fat or th thoracolumbar junction first, and then maybe they get a little bit of extension through their spine. And they get no extension through their thoracic spine, and then they get some in their C spine. And then you go the, the other way um, into flexion, and you know, there's little flexion in, in the lumbar spine, you get huge flexion through the thoracic spine. So it's there's this common dysfunction that I see with male rowers, particularly. Um, and then if they continue to just go up and down through the motions, they're just going to accentuate that dysfunction um, versus trying to, you know, extend through that thoracic spine, stabilize that TL junction, get a little more flexion through the lumbar spine. Um, so that's something we've been working on quite a bit. And it's, it's not fun and it's not easy, um, but it will help to mitigate that mechanical back pain because now you're um, applying the load and the stress equally amongst the segments versus all at one segment um, or a few different segments. No, absolutely. That's, that's, uh, that's great. And I love bringing it back home. Like when you're, when you're executing an exercise, the, the focus and the intent has to be, um, it has to be there or, you know, there is real no inherent benefit to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, something else we've been implementing a lot um, in terms of rehab is isometric training. 
And um, what I found, again, to bring up the, you know, we can't pull them out of training. Um, Sometimes they need to train through things. So how do we increase the strength of the tissue under control without causing them pain that is going to create a dysfunction or compensation or an inability to row their next session. So obviously eccentrics have been shown to um, increase tissue strength, um, but they're not very comfortable. Um, They can cause some pain. (coughs) So what's an alternative to try and get strength through the full range of motion um, without causing that pain? That's not to say we don't do eccentrics. There's definitely a time and a place. But what can the athletes do day to day to increase specific joint angle strength? Excuse me. Um, Without the the stress and inflammation of eccentric movement. So we've implemented isometric training a lot. And, you know, research shows that you have – 10 to 15 degrees on either end of a specific joint angle. So if you train a joint angle, you know, you should be able to achieve that strength in that angle 10 to 15 degrees on either side. So we'll break up a movement, say a squat. If someone's having knee pain, um, they'll do an isometric at, you know, 15 degrees of knee flexion, then 30 degrees, then um, 45 and so on. And so they're increasing their strength at that specific joint angle, but not getting that friction from, from the movement. So we found that really beneficial both in um, getting specific joint angle control. So if someone's having trouble, you know, keeping stable at the catch, we'll do isometrics in that specific position, um, but also as a rehab tool to decrease pain and um, inflammation while increasing strength um, as part of their, their rehab tool. That's awesome. I love, I love how you're able to tie that right into, um, some of the biomechanics of the rowing stroke. And so the athlete can see the, the inherent value in in doing that exercise. So they're going to be clearly more motivated to, you know, pay attention and listen and and follow through on executing it at a high level. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, results kind of speak for themselves. Um, I don't know many people that enjoy doing rehab exercises or prehab exercises or isometrics or stretching. But um, if you can explain it in a way that, you know, your athlete or your patient or your client understands the purpose and they can see they can, they can see that purpose. And then on top of that, they can see the results after consistent work, you know, then they're going to, that's going to be what motivates them to, to continue to do that tedious, um, not as sexy work. Um, right. Right. (laughs) what, What we found with the FRC. So we do, a we do a session depending on the year once or twice a week where, you know, it's 30 minutes, they can choose the exercise they stretch, but we do it as a group. You know, we do, it's, um, it's about a five minute protocol per stretch. Um, so it's, it's kind of long. Um, but they've, they've seen the benefits. They've seen the benefits and the way their body feels in terms of pain. You know, they, they're getting more depth in their squat in the gym. They're able to achieve the coaching cues they're being asked to do on the water because they have, you know, more degrees of freedom to move. Um, so when they can see those benefits, then, you know, they're, they're going to continue to do that. And, you know, we've, we've kind of made a shift in the last few years with this group in terms of, you know, self-management and self-recognition of, you know, okay, I'm a little sore here. I'm going to stretch. Okay. Yeah. You know, that doesn't feel good or, you know, it's not getting better with the stretching. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to check in with, with Sarah or another therapist. Um, 
but it's kind of creating that ownership and that responsibility of, you know, they need to recognize when their body's not functioning optimally. And then that creates that integrated approach in their rehab as well, that it's not a passive treatment to get them better. You know, yes, we do some manual therapy, but in order to, to make those changes stick or in order for them to have control out of the new range of motion, it needs, it needs internal input. It needs input from their muscles and their joints and they can only do that themselves. So it's, it's definitely created um, a, a better understanding of what they need to do to get better as well. So it's, you know, it's a combination approach. It's not just, okay, I'm a little sore. I'm going to lie on the table. Now I feel better and I'm going to go row tomorrow. And then three weeks because I didn't actually do anything to make me stronger, to move better. Um, I didn't, I didn't give myself that input so that my tissues knew what to do. Yeah. Maybe I have better range of motion, but I don't have control. So then now I'm back on the table. So it's really, really an integrated approach of, you know, yes, you do need um, some manual therapy. You need somebody to let you know when you're not moving optimally and to help guide the tissue. Um, but that, that's got to be backed up by, by exercise as well if you want long-term, long-term uh, results. So, um, and that, again, that's a benefit of being in this centralized, integrated environment is that you can kind of follow up on that stuff as well and go through through that day to day, um, and help guide that, guide that process. Cause it's not, it's not easy, especially when you're tired from six or seven hours of training. So, um, they, they are seeing the importance, but, um, but yeah, we just continue to integrate it into their, into their training. That's, that's awesome. That's fantastic. It's awesome to hear, um, how well it's working and that the, the athletes see the benefit and are continuing to do it. And it, it just seems to sort of um, really becoming more and more part of uh, the, the entire, you know, center, what you're doing from across the, the rowing you know, on the water, the strength and conditioning, prehab, rehab. Um, so that's great. That's very cool to see. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I normally do a rapid fire with, with the guests, but we're, we're, just under uh, one o'clock and I know you have to run. So um, we can sneak in like one or two questions and then I'll let you go. Sounds good. Okay. So given your current level of experience and knowledge, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Huh? Um, take, take better care of myself really. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's all to, I, I played multiple sports as a teenager and, you know, didn't take care of my body. And, um, you know, I'm realizing now I, you know, I really want to practice what I preach, but I have all this dysfunction from my injuries as a teenager that, you know, I didn't address properly. I didn't warm up. I didn't cool down. You know, I didn't have, I didn't seek help from professionals that could, you know, help me achieve the movements that I needed to achieve for my many different sports. And so I'm, I'm paying for it a little bit now. Um, and it's a lot of hard work and, you know, we're, we're born with, you know, the prerequisites for proper human movement and it's, it's what we do and it's what we don't do throughout the years of our lives that, you know, shape our function as we get older. So, um, yeah, I would, I would give that advice to myself because I think that would not only help my own body, but also, you know, help me to, uh, in, in my role as a therapist to be able to achieve better movement myself. Um, and it's so much easier when you already have the prerequisites and you can, you can just strengthen as you go through, but when you have to create joints again, because there is a dysfunction, it's a lot, it's a lot more work. So I would have, 
I would tell myself that I want to achieve and maintain the movement that I had, you know, as a kid, um, as I go through my sports as a teenager so that I can function better as an adult. Um, so I think that would help me both personally and, and professionally and would help anybody that, you know, is, is at that age and still has, has that range of motion that you need to, you need to keep it. Um, cause it's hard to get it back, but you can maintain it through daily, daily movement through your end ranges. So we just too often don't stress our bodies at end range. Um, and, you know, you lose it, you lose that end range. That's awesome. Um, that was great advice. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it's one o'clock, so I'll let you go. Uh, but thank you so much for, for coming on, sharing your, your experiences and, and knowledge and uh, everything with the rowing community. Great. Thanks for having me a lot, Joe. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. We'll have to do it again. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leo Training Podcast. If you could take a moment of your time, head on over to iTunes and drop it a five-star review, I would greatly appreciate it. Or please share it on your favorite social media network, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And be sure to tune in next week as I continue my ramp up and build up throughout the Rio Olympic Games with another rowing-based theme interview. I'll be interviewing Theo Pickles, the strength and conditioning coach for the Netherlands rowing team. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.